Good morning, everybody. Welcome to part three of the UCLA Food Allergy Webinar Series. Today's focus will be on the high school years and early adulthood. My name is Jessica Reed, and I'm joined by Kara Horowitz, and we are the chairs of the UCLA Food Allergy Parent Committee. Like many of you, I am a parent of a food allergic teenager, so I very much share your struggles and I echo many of your questions. Uh, managing a child's food allergies from infancy to adulthood requires both information and support. There are two key places where my family has found the information and support that we've needed to navigate the world of food allergies. First is the food allergy parent community. Connecting with other parents has always helped me feel like I'm never alone in the trenches. Second is our allergists at UCLA. They are experts in the field and have always been our primary trusted source for the most up-to-date food allergy information. They take an individualized and holistic approach to their patient's care. Uh, a personal example is a few years into oral immunotherapy, my son started having GI issues and a lot of discomfort when swallowing. Our allergist looped in both GI and ENT specialists from UCLA. And within a few weeks, my son was diagnosed with EOE, eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, and what I was most grateful for was that the team of doctors together came up with a personalized management plan for my son that took into account considerations across medical specialties. So these two factors, information and support, were really the impetus for creating the UCLA Food Allergy Parent Committee. We're a group of parents and UCLA doctors and staff who really wanna better the lives of families impacted by food allergies. Our committee helps raise funds for research, including clinical trials, and for the expansion of the UCLA Food Allergy Program. We advocate for the food allergy community within UCLA and outside of it, and most importantly, we foster personal connections. If your child is a patient in the UCLA Food Allergy Program, our committee is here to connect with you and to support you. Today, I am very excited for our conversation about navigating food allergies in teens and young adults, especially because I have a 16-year-old. We'll address both the medical side of food allergies, as well as some of the social and emotional challenges that arise for food allergic teens and young adults. We'll also hear about amazing groundbreaking work that UCLA is doing on behalf of all food allergic kids and their families. And now I would like to introduce Kara Horowitz. Thank you, Jessica. My name is Kara and I'm both a food allergy patient and a food allergy parent. I have had an anaphylactic allergy to peanuts since I was a baby. When I was growing up and fewer people understood food allergies, I had several terrifying reactions. As an adult, I was determined to avoid another scary incident. So I used to call restaurants and if they said they used peanuts in the kitchen, I didn't feel safe eating there. I also avoided any food that might contain traces of peanuts or cross contamination. I spent countless hours doing research and fearing that something could go wrong. When my middle son, Will, who is now 10, was little, he was diagnosed with a peanut and tree nut allergy. My concerns about and fear of food allergies grew exponentially. Six years ago, we had the incredible good fortune to meet Dr. Rita Katru at UCLA, just as she was starting to desensitize patients via oral immunotherapy or teaching one's body to tolerate increasing amounts of food to which to, of the food to which they're allergic. While Will and I are still allergic, we are each able to tolerate much more of the nuts that have always been so dangerous for us. Our allergies are infinitely more manageable and the treatment we received from Dr. Catru impacts both of our lives every day. As Jessica mentioned, today's discussion focuses on food allergies among teens and young adults. Our incredible UCLA experts will answer some of the questions you submitted when you registered for today's session. The Q&A function in Zoom is on. So please feel free to write in your questions and we will try to address them today, time permitting, or we will use them to inform our future programs. We'll also be sharing more information about food allergy clinical care and research at UCLA. We're excited to discuss the program's strategic vision to ultimately provide better futures for our children. We encourage you to please complete the survey that will be sent out to you after the webinar. 
It will ask you to evaluate your experience in this virtual event series and ask what you're most interested in learning about in the future. Now, I would love to welcome our UCLA expert faculty to join Jessica and me on screen. I'm honored to turn it over to Dr. Rita Kachu. Thank you, Cara and Jessica. I'm Rita Katrun. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you for coming and hopefully you'll find this useful. Um, I, uh, my focus is on food allergy, as many of you know, and I'm a co-director with Maria Garcia Loret of the Food Allergy Program. So thanks for joining us. I'm gonna send, uh, Maria, would you like to say a few words? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm never short for words. <laughs> uh, this, my name is Maria Garcia Loret and I'm, um, in the Department of Pediatrics. I've been a pediatric um, allergy immunology subspecialist for many, many years. And together with Rita, we are the co-founders and the co-directors of the um, UCLA Food Allergy Program. And as such, we feel you know, honored, but at the same competent to um, present in this uh, webinar. And now I'll pass the torch to Dr. Butte. Thank you, Maria, and nice to meet everyone here. I'm glad to be here. And uh, my name is Manish Butte. I'm one of the uh, pediatrician scientists here at UCLA. I'm the division chief for allergy, immunology, and rheumatology and pediatrics. And um, my, I'm also a, a scientist. My lab studies the immune system and how it responds to infections and autoimmunity and um, tolerance, things like food allergy. So, you know, it's always an exciting topic for me and uh, happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Butte, Dr. Katru, Dr. Garcia Lorette for joining us today. Before we dive into the questions that were pre-submitted by our registrants, we do want to remind our audience that the faculty cannot answer specific medical questions, but they can discuss more broad food allergy questions and the direction of food allergy care at UCLA. Also, the information shared today is based strictly on the latest research available and is not intended to be a judgment about how any family or individual manages food allergies. With that said, our first question is for Dr. Garcia Lorette. Dr. Garcia Lorette, how well does oral immunotherapy or OIT work clinically if it's not started until the teenage years? Well, thank you, Kara, for asking that question. Um, our team, you know, Dr. Katra, I, I and, the, and, and the faculty at UCLA has accrued substantial you know, expertise in the management of oral immunotherapy and the implementation and assessment of results for the last five to six years. Um, I'm, I'm saying that because most of the studies that we have um, from, you know, published in the literature are, are very focused or, or heterogeneous until in terms of um, age-related adverse events or tolerance or what have you. Our impression, and that is confirmed by a few studies that are uh, reported in the literature, that it works exactly the same way in terms of immunological results. You know, only 2% of kids will abandon whether they are two years old or 15. I think the challenges don't come, you know, predominantly from the immune system. It, they come predominantly what I call the buy-in. Um, adolescents have to buy into the process of oral immunotherapy. Adolescents tend to have more symptoms, be more aware of their symptoms and have developed over time food aversions. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of the oral immunotherapy is a little bit more challenging. I think the outcome are exactly the same. And in a way, I would say it is never too late to start with oral immunotherapy. Thank you. Uh, the question from my point to Dr. Butte is, do you think that there are any immune reasons? Is there a time in our life when it is too late? Speaking personally, I hope the answer is no. Uh, you know, I, I also, I actually developed food allergies in my 40s. And so I am um, very sympathetic with our patients who are not very young kids and who have to deal with food allergies themselves. Um, but, but you're really, I think, asking a question that um, goes beyond my personal experience and into the underlying immunology, which is, of course, near and dear to my heart. Um, yeah, so this is kind of cool. Most uh, food allergy exposures 
uh, that uh, for most food exposures in early childhood don't develop into allergies. As you know, most of us can feed most of our kids and get them to eat most foods uh, without any problem. And yet there are some people and some foods that really seem to elicit this, this pattern of, of, a, of a defect of tolerance of making allergies. And, um, and I think one exciting part of recent immunology work is to try to understand uh, this idea of what's called a window of tolerance, that there may be some periods in early childhood where uh, exposing kids to these foods very, very early on, the first months and years of life, um, actually allow the body to take in those foods, uh, even though they're foreign proteins from other you know, species, et cetera, and still be able to be tolerant of them. And, and there has been this idea, especially in the last few years, that this window of tolerance closes at some point, that beyond this point now, any food that you get isn't going to be as easily tolerated. Um, I would say that that is starting to be broken open a little bit. We understand more and more the underlying immune mechanisms as to where tolerance occurs, why that window seems to be so open in early childhood. Um, and it gives us a chance to actually manipulate that window, keep it open, and allow people to develop tolerance even later in life. Um, so one of the hints has been that the exposure route by which foreign foods get into the body uh, could be a very important hint into early childhood and why they develop systemic uh, allergies. Uh, by that, I mean uh, some kids who have uh, exposure to foreign foods through the skin, uh, kids who have eczema and who are scratching and they have broken uh, a barrier function of their skin. When foods are exposed through the skin route, um, there is evidence both in humans and in you know, species uh, that we study as model systems like mice, that when you expose foods through this route, you can actually get a harder time to develop tolerance, that it actually becomes more difficult. This is one of the theories in the last few years behind uh, treating eczema really early in infancy to try to keep the skin intact uh, and try to avoid that sensitization of foods through the skin route. Um, and it's known that in older kids who develop allergies, uh, sometimes milder allergies, not always, but when you develop allergies in older years, uh, they may not be as severe because the sensitization route isn't through the skin. Uh, early infancy and early childhood um, and eczema of early infancy and that route seems to be less of an important factor for sensitization and allergies in older years. Um, and it could be, for example, um, uh, through uh, proteins that are similar to pollens and other foods that really end up driving some of the uh, allergic sensitization, sort of the beachhead uh, for developing allergies in, in later years. Uh, okay, so this gives us a treatment strategy, right? We are going to aggressively treat eczema in early infancy now. We all, we all do that. Uh, and, and we think a lot about this um, atopic march, how skin sensitization can lead to gut sensitization, can lead to developmental allergies and asthma in later years. Um, anyway, but I think this, this the, you know, I, don't, I could go on forever about the immunology, but I think the, uh, the, the important lesson is, is, is what Maria ended with too, is that um, there is an opportunity to develop tolerance even through adolescence, even into adulthood. We just have to become, uh, we have to study this more and try to understand more how people are getting exposed, what routes we have to actually give them safe exposures and develop um, tolerance. And, and I think a great example of that is OIT you know, to be able to give very safe exposures through the oral route and develop either desensitization or, or sustained remission uh, is now possible. You know, you guys are doing it all the time. And, um, and so, yes, it um, still can be maintained throughout adolescence and adulthood. Thank you. And I'm going to continue on with some OIT questions. This one um, is very personal. <laughs> I know mm. that uh, parents are usually the driving force in his or her child's OIT regimen. So we remind our teens to take their dose. We make them capsules. We put their dose in smoothies. We make muff muffins, anything to make it more tolerable for them. So my question is, how can we prepare our kids during the high school years for maintaining their OIT when they go off to college or are otherwise on their own for the first time? Dr. Katru. Right, you have some ideas. Um, that's a great question, uh, Jessica. Um, so we know developmentally, uh, young adults, adolescents um, want more independence, right? So it's a, it's a developmentally, they're actually looking for independence, which is good. That's what we want. We want them to become more and more independent in life, right? And that's the phase that that adolescent, those adolescent years, which actually can put them 
you know, at higher risk because they're making their own assessments, they have to decide what they're doing, whether it's uh, dealing with food allergies, whether it's dealing with situations socially, whether it's dealing with deciding whether to go to a movie or finish their homework, um, developmentally, they have to start making those decisions. So specifically, um, not only for food allergies, but in general, um, it's really important for parents to acknowledge that this is a normal developmental milestone, just like sitting at six months, walking at a year, you know, things that we were more um, in control of as, as parents. But as a parent of three adolescents, I can tell you that it is a normal milestone and it's a good milestone. We want this. We want them to eventually be able to take care of themselves. So as parents, if we can first acknowledge that it's a normal milestone, it's a good milestone, and then encourage them to come up with plans to remember, first of all, they have to buy in. I love that Maria said that. That's actually very important in this age group. It's important in little kids as well, but really important important for an adolescent who really wants to have independence and wants to make their own decisions is for them to buy in. Why are they doing this? Do you remember why we're doing this? Is it worth it to do it? Do you, how do you feel about it? Do you remember what the reaction was? A lot of times they don't even remember the reaction if they had a severe reaction as a baby or um, is, you know, let's talk about why we're doing this in the first place. Okay. And if we are buying in and we're understanding why we're doing it, then what are the ways that we can remember. So routines, you know, we remember to brush our teeth and, you know, do you brush your teeth in the morning? You do. Okay. So where's your toothbrush that reminds you to brush your teeth or, you know, put your, you know, put a reminder there or what do you eat? You know, when do you do your dose? Is it right after dinner? Put a, you know, before you eat dinner, put your dose there so that you remember right after dinner, you eat it. So basically setting up, um, uh, helping them come up with a schedule to remember to take it. But this is the age that they have to really start taking ownership. They want that. They want that. And so it's really important for us as parents to acknowledge that and then help them come up with ways of remembering. But that first step, uh, I agree with Maria at this age, is they have to buy in. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Garcia Lorette. This is another question submitted by the audience. Recently, I read about how the hormonal changes that take place during puberty can make allergies worse for some young women. How does that impact OIT? Is it best to complete OIT before puberty? And how concerned should parents be that their younger children may get more allergic as they get older? Okay, so it's like four questions in one, uh, and I only have two minutes, but um, it is true that, that um, allergy as a whole changes drastically in puberty. Um, while in, in the before eight or before 10, um, both allergic reactions, especially anaphylaxis and reactivity in the food allergy space is far more severe in boys. And you, your mother's boys and you know that um, somehow after puberty um, both the severe the incidence and the severity of diseases such as uh, asthma and food allergy completely switches to to the to the side of females um, uh, estrogens and the variety of things that happen during puberty for women affect obviously deeply the immune system and as you know females are not only more uh, in terms of number and severity of food allergy, drug allergy, and asthma, far more uh, prevalent and severe, uh, but women are also more prone to autoimmune disease, you know, like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and, and MS. So we got shorthanded <laughs> in, that, in that regard. I don't think that that makes um, oral immunotherapy any more difficult or more challenging. Um, yes, females might have um, allergic reactions a little bit more severe, and we are hyper cautious because the data is not there yet. So I think both Rita and I, we, you know, sometimes, oh, you're in the middle of your, your menses, just hold the dose for today, but there is no data that shows it. And there is a lot of data that says you get more asthma, more food allergies, more hives, more lupus, you name it, you have it. Um, so I don't think that you need to start oral immunotherapy before puberty. 
puberty is coming, you know, earlier and earlier in Western societies. <laughs> so I don't think that the, the, the question is we take from what we know in the literature, we make some precautions, is equally doable. And again, it is not too late after you had, you know, your first period. Uh, and I'm going to pass again to Dr. Butte because he's the one that explains to me why women are affected by immune disease so much more frequently after puberty compared to males. Yes, and I, this is not gender equality. Yes, no, I this am, is reality. I am an expert at women, <laughs> as, you, <laughs> as you know, as my poor. 14 year old daughter will tell you not, um, but I, but I do find um, the, the role of sex hormones in how they influence the immune response to be uh, really interesting because, um, because it's, it's, it's actually conserved in mice and in other creatures that you can then use and manipulate and study and, and learn a little bit about how estrogen and progesterone, uh, you know, two dominant sex hormones uh, really actually can change immune responses. Uh, tolerance and, and reactivity and, and uh, even sensitization. Um, but starting with the, um, the, the clinical findings, I think it's a general principle at this point that we understand that, um, that before puberty, uh, boys tend to be more affected with allergic sensitization, allergic disease. Uh, I'm just right, painting with a very broad brush here. Uh, whereas after puberty, many allergic diseases become either equal or worse for girls. Uh, and that's true for atopic dermatitis, asthma, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, penicillin allergy, um, uh, allergy to um, you know uh, other drugs, uh, and food allergies. Uh, the the only um, aside, the only sort of exception to that is EOE. Uh, EOE seems to be dominated by boys throughout all the years, <laughs> young old. Uh, mm -hmm. but that actually a significant ratio, three to one ratio for boys. But, um, but okay, that aside, why? <laughs> why is it that girls are getting it, uh, getting hit harder after puberty? Um, and, and of course, can we implicate uh, the rising levels and cycling of the, of the sex hormones that, that drive some of this? Um, I think the answer is yes. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more to be learned. I'll just give a hint uh, of the stuff that I've been able to think about uh, in the last, um, in my reading of this topic. Uh, Estradiol, as you know, is just sort of a, a major sex hormone, and it, it seems to in, enhance sensitization. So if you like give mice an allergen and give them extra estradiol, or you uh, or you over or the mice, uh, or you treat males with that, you could you could approach this in multiple ways. You can actually drive extra sensitization. Um, so it does look like estradiol makes uh, more sensitization for food allergies. It also enhances mast cell activation. So if you trigger those food allergies, they actually respond uh, more severely. Uh, interestingly, progesterone seems to block some of that. So progesterone actually suppresses mast cell activation, mast cell degranulation, et cetera, uh, to an extent. Uh, these are not all or nothing. These are tuning of the immune responses. And we're not really sure why evolution did this. Why did evolution offer this kind of tuning, uh, especially uh, after puberty when there's cyclic, cyclic uh, tuning? So. A, a time that reactions might occur is when progesterone levels fall, that suppression is falling, and estradiol levels are high. And that would be, sort of, just as Maria said, right around the time uh, of the, of the uh, menses. So, and, and I, I think clinically that bears out, although I actually don't know. I think it might be worth doing a study to ask, um, is there more anaphylaxis or are there more reactions uh, when girls are uh, right around the time of their periods than, than uh, for example, during the luteal phase when progesterone levels are high? Um, I think that's interesting, uh, and that might be one avenue to, to go after this question. Another is the role of sex hormones and how they affect um, the gut microbiome. So it turns out that the gut microbiome, the bacteria that we have within us that sort of maintain our immune tolerance, those actually are quite different between uh, males and females, uh, both, and, and also different between pre puberty and after puberty. So there's a lot more to learn about how those bacterial changes uh, affect our set points for tolerance. And, and anyway, it's, it's an exciting topic. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you know, like confirms how much we have to learn and how the, you know, part of this webinar is so useful for all of us to think on the aspects that parents and families have that we sometimes jump over and, you know, exciting time for research. Exactly. I'm yeah. going to bring it back a little bit to the social emotional, um, Dr. Katru. Uh, at a time when kids are trying to individualize and maybe subject to peer pressure, 
Do you have any tips for encouraging team compliance with their food allergy regimens, like avoiding risky behaviors that might lead them to ingest one of their allergens or advocating for themselves in social situations? Um, so, you know, the psychosocial um, impact of food allergies is, is very dear to my heart because I think that is a big component of um, how well they'll fare medically, right? So I think clinically we focus on, you know, tolerance and, you know, are they going to have symptoms? But I really think the, the psycho, uh, psychological uh, impact is, is great on whether or not they will do well with OIT or other clinical in interventions and how well they'll do period in life. Um, and so adolescence is, again, this this amazing period of time in their life, right? So you've done such an amazing job as a parent to get them up to this point where now they want to become their own individuals and have their independence. So I would, you know, say whether it comes to food allergies, whether it comes to making decisions of what they're going to do at a party, whether they're going to decide, you know, whether they're going to uh, deal with other um, issues with peer pressure. Because remember, this is a point where they do want to fit in. They want to um, make sure that they're going along with their peers. They're maybe even looking to their peers more than they're looking to their parents for advice. Um, and so, you know, again, as a, a parent and a, and a pediatrician, I would say during this phase is really crucial for parents to create a space that kids can feel comfortable talking to them, whether it has to do with food allergies, whether it's how they're dealing with pressure at a party, whether it's how they're dealing with, again, making decisions about whether to go out socially or study or whatever the decisions are to create that space. And so that is actually much harder to do um, than, yeah, okay, great. We'll put some cushions out. It'll be a lovely space. No, emotionally create a space, right? So where we're not judging them for their decisions, because there will be a lot of times, and uh, you know, I've had the opportunity not only um, professionally to work with a lot of adolescents, but I have a lot of friends who have older children, and I've really learned from them as well. Um, whether it, again, has to, food allergy is just one extension. Uh, they're dealing with, with how to deal with oral immunotherapy, how to deal with situations where they have to tell people they're allergic or have to carry an EpiPen. These are all basically dealing with the same situations that developmentally they're going through during adolescence. And so creating that space where they can say to you, hey, today I had to tell someone that I didn't know that I was allergic to a food and I hated that feeling. I hated, I hated that they had to order something different because of me and that everybody had to order something different, right? Um, okay, well, how, you know, that sucks. I, I agree. And, and really, you know, go ex uh, explaining to them that you understand that maybe even if you don't have a food allergy, you can't fully sympathize because you've never gone through, but you can empathize with them that, yeah, you're right. It, it is, it is a difficult situation, but remind them that there's other people who have other difficult situations. And now what are we going to do? Let's come up with some ideas that you can do the next time, right? What are some, what are some things you can say? Maybe if you don't want to say you have a food allergy, you say, I'm not really hungry right now. I, I'd rather not eat. Or maybe you would say, um, yeah, you know what? I, I don't eat these foods and I, I kind of don't want to talk about it or, you know, come up with different ways. Again, developmentally, they're going to be dealing with this, not just with food allergies, but with other, other things, right? So you're at a party, someone says, hey, do you want a cigarette? What are you going to say? Um, either you're going to say, yeah, I'm okay. Or if they're kind of pushing you, pushing you, oh, I have a medical issue. I don't want to do it. Or I, yeah, you know what? I'm not feeling well, you know, whatever the, the, the answer is going to be, help your teenager come up with those, those answers so that they have things to pull from when they're in those situations, role play with them. When someone comes up to you, when you're meeting someone new, what do you want to say? What do you want to, um, what, at what point do you want to share with them your medical conditions or not? Um, and so really creating that space is going to be crucial so that they can, because these are real feelings. It, it is, uh, it does cause anxiety. They're going to be having anxiety from other reasons unrelated to their food allergies. And so having that space for them to speak and not being judgmental about what their, their uh, reactions are. Um, is, is going to be huge on every level, even when they go off to college. The other thing I would actually recommend is for, um, for them to take leadership roles. So I have several kids who have food allergies who kind of reached out and said, hey, you know what, I want to I want to I want to set up a situation where other kids who are like me feel comfortable. So we have one 
uh, one of our children in our oral immunotherapy program who's setting up a buddy uh, a buddy program um, a, along with Kara um, to um, to be able to have families uh, meet other families who've gone through it, maybe even learn from other families who now have teenagers or who have kids in college. So encourage them to take these leadership positions. I think that really helps or lead leadership roles. Um, and then again, creating that space and really listening, encouraging them to, um, to come up with plans uh, before they're in those situations. Thank you very much. The next question is for Dr. Garcia Lorette. Is it true that teens and adolescents are more prone to anaphylaxis and fatal reactions from their food allergies? And what are some tips to encourage this group to carry their EpiPens with them? Well, the, it is true. It is true they're more prone, but we can divide the prone in two sections. One is contextual. That is pretty much what Rita alluded to. They're more prone because they're not looking what they're eating, because maybe they're taking a drink when they shouldn't, because they're exercise, you know, especially maybe moving around too much where they're not paying attention. That is kind of the contextual part of it. Um, they're also more prone because, mind you, you know, you can develop food allergies, new food allergies as you grow older. You're not essentially done with food allergy by the time you're six, you know, you can catch, you know, later. Um, one of the common food allergies that adolescents and, and young adults experience is what we call oral allergy syndrome that, ha that is related to pollen allergies. Um, and then all of a sudden they could eat, you know, peaches, you know, I think Dr. <laughs> Dr. Bu can attest to that. Uh, you know, you could, you know, they could, you could eat something, uh, you know, and then at 17, all of a sudden, this other food that was never dangerous. So they become, in a way, more, more prone because they can develop new allergies that they didn't have before. Even good old milk allergy, you can catch it in your 20s uh, when they're not paying attention, when parents are not paying attention. Um, there is also a particular form of anaphylaxis that for some reason, it's also more common in adolescents and young adults, what we call exercise-induced food-dependent anaphylaxis. You know, you could eat sandwiches all your life and go in the treadmill and all of a sudden at 19 or 20 or 25, you get anaphylaxis when you're on the treadmill. So these are like new awareness that they didn't have before. And that's, so there is, there is physiological prone and there is contextual prone. The question that refers to fatal anaphylaxis, yes, it's true. You know, every year, you know, there is, you know, probably about four or five, you know, four dozen people that, that die of anaphylaxis, of the food allergy. 80% um, of those are gonna be either adolescents and young adults. And when they, I have to tell you the people that are listening to this, you have to realize that the occurrence is extremely rare. Of course, one patient that dies of, of a peanut allergy is one too many. However, um, if you look in the context, it's about one in 200,000. You know, that's kind of the frequency if you think how many patients with food allergy are in the US at this time and the deaths secondary to anaphylaxis. When, when we've looked back over the years, you know, what are the reasons? Well, in 70% in of the cases, the main reason is not having the epinephrine with them. Um, maybe waiting a little bit too much. Asthma is another risk factor. So not having the epinephrine, have a history of asthma, and perhaps feeling invincible um, and say, oh, I, you know, I'm going to get this and I'm going to walk myself to, to the hospital. Those are the, the things that people have. They call it recum recumbent position or standing position. So the short of it is, if they carry the epinephrine, they're going to be just fine. 90% of, of those uh, deaths could have been averted. So it is in their hands. Now, what we're asking from people is, sometimes a little bit too much. How we can convince them to carry the epinephrine? 
in all honesty, let's improve the device. This, this, let's improve the administration. Um, that thingy, the Epi, EpiPen is kind of cumbersome. Nobody wants to take it. If we can fit all the information in the world in, in an iPhone that is this big, you tell me why cannot the, the pharmaceutical industry devote their efforts to have a device that is far more portable, that does not depend on temperature, and it doesn't have that aggressive orange color that, that the EpiPen has. So I am trusting that our, you know, our generation and forward, we already have a little device that is better taught, you know, accepted by, by um, young adults and adolescents. And I think soon to be, there will be probably inhalant forms of epinephrine. So those 60 something that occurred every year, I think we could reduce them to two or three. And that's what all that I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, that causes a little anxiety. So speaking of anxiety, Dr. Mm -hmm. Katru, uh, how can we help our teens and young adults deal with their anxiety related to food allergy? Because I know it's very prevalent. It is. And I guess, you know, again, my, my first advice would be acknowledging that it's normal developmentally to have anxiety um, during this phase in life, not only of the, the patient or the child who may have food allergies, but also the, the parent and the family having to give up some of the um, caretaking kind of roles and allowing the child to make some independent decisions. So there's anxiety everywhere, right? So everyone's feeling it. The parents are feeling it. The kids are feeling it. The brother and sister are feeling it. The dogs even like what's going on. I'm feeling it. So everyone's feeling that. So how can we then you know, decrease it a little bit. Again, creating that space to have those conversations. I will tell you as, um, you know, uh, advice of, of having adolescents with food allergies or other medical conditions is um, I remember having a conversation with a friend who had kids who were 10 years older and I, and my kids were like running around and, you know, I was driving them everywhere. And I was like, oh, you're so lucky you're done. Like they're kind of just spending for themselves. And now you get to just hang out and go out to, you know, hang out with your friends. And they were like, are you kidding? Now I'm actually even more engaged than when that, that was easy. Right. I would just kind of stick them together and, you know, I could control it. Now I actually have to really engage. And so one thing, you know, I'm not going to put this all on the, the child who has the food allergy. It's, I, I'm, if you notice, I'm saying a lot to the parents that we have to take, you know, we have to understand that this is a growth. This is independence time. This is great. This is amazing that they're at this phase, at this phase is um, where we can actually say, hey, you know, we understand um, that you're making these decisions, um, you know, talk to us tell us, we'll help you. And then also reach out to people who specialize in this. So like, you know, it's, there's no taboo to seeing a psychologist, a psychologist. And this is what I tell my patients. So I would say, reach out to your family, you know, create a space where they feel comfortable talking to you as parents. Um, and, and the best way to create that space is not to be a parent that immediately judges their decisions or reactions, but maybe responds to a poor decision because they will have poor decisions um, and says, oh, okay, I, I guess I understand why you, you know, why'd you, why'd you do that? Why did you not carry your EpiPen? Oh, I was embarrassed. It's bright orange. I don't like to carry it. It's so big. Okay. Um, but you know, do you, you know, do you, do you remember when you had your reaction and do you understand why were you carrying an EpiPen and how do you feel about that? And what are ways that we can maybe carry it? Can we put it in a different location? Kind of helping them, working with them, giving them the independence to feel like they're making the decisions, but you're kind of encouraging how to work through what their issue is. And where I bring a psychologist in is if I say, look, either we're not we're not communicating properly. I, I feel like, you know, we're all in the same space. We all want, I want you to be safe. You want to be safe. We all want to be safe. But for whatever reason, this isn't, uh, we're not communicating properly. Or maybe we need some advice on some behavioral modifications to decrease our anxiety a little bit, to understand, okay, you know, I, I had a very interesting kid um, who 
unfortunately was hit by a car when they're riding their bike. So not even food related, just hitting, you know, was driving their bike or riding their bike. They got hit by a car and got to a point where they were afraid to cross streets because in their mind, they, every time they looked at a street, they would be worried that they would be hitting a car. Same thing, food allergy. Every time they go to a restaurant, it's, is this going to be the time that I'm going to have my reaction? And working with a psychologist, they were able to learn modifications to understand, no, every time I cross the street, it's not going to happen. Every time I eat at a restaurant, it's not going to happen. If I put these precautions in place, I look both ways. I don't talk on my phone. I make sure. So those are the precautions I'm going to take to not be hit by a car. And the precautions I'm going to take to not um, have a reaction at a restaurant are going to be these. I'm going to ask what, what foods they have on, you know, what's in the menu. I'm going to maybe take one bite, wait a minute, uh, or five minutes, make sure that there's no reactions, but remember everything is dose dependent. And this is the age I really tell uh, adolescents to do this and young adults um, is take a bite, especially if it's a food that maybe you've never eaten before. They've told you that there's no allergen in it, but you wanna be sure, take a bite, wait 10, 15 minutes, see how you feel and then continue to eat because it is dose dependent. If you feel those reactions, back off on it or treat yourself. Um, so those were kind of be the, the things to help with anxiety. Anxiety is gonna be there both from the parent and the child. So look for resources within your community, talk to other parents who've had kids with food allergies, reach out to psychologists, seeing a dietitian can help. Um, how can we maybe vary the diet? Um, talk to the doctor because a lot of times the doctor can maybe even set them up. I've, I've, this is why we're starting the buddy program. I've had so many situations and Jessica and Tara, you personally have done this for us um, where we have a very anxious family and we're like, look, we'd love you to meet another uh, family that's active in our food allergy uh, program to give you advice. So really reaching out to the community and, um, and understanding anxiety is normal, that this is all normal develop, part of development. Thank you very much. Dr. Garcia Lorette, let's talk about EOE. Can you explain briefly what it is and whether being diagnosed with EOE excludes a patient from being treated for food allergies, like being treated by desensitization, for example? Okay, so EOE, <laughs> you, you put it out there, EOE, go hold it. Um, that is an insider information for eosinophilic esophagitis. It's a different, what we think at this point, a different kind of food allergy that was, or environmental allergy that, that started getting, you know, popularity in the 2000s. Um, it has been associated in studies, in, in clinical trials of oral immunotherapy, you know, in 2.5% of patients develop this EOE. That is a, a presence with symptoms of dysphagia or getting like food stuck, not anaphylaxis, uh, dysphagia, abdominal pain, um, is more like a chronic, you know, inflammation in the esophagus. Um, this association is, you know, just observational. No, it's not proven because nobody does, you know, an endoscopy before starting OIT. However, in the clinical trials, and this is people from industry that they don't want anything to confuse their results, patients with EOE are excluded. In our practice, and I think Rita, that's exactly the same. Um, I don't say no, you know, I think, I think EOE probably, you know, if, if it was severe EOE longstanding, perhaps it wouldn't be on the best interest of the patient to start on oral immunotherapy. But in other cases, you know, maybe when it was distant, you know, in infancy, I don't see why not. More importantly, the future of oral immunotherapy is definitely linked to biologics. You know, we need to make oral immunotherapy easier and faster. Um, and biologics such as, as dupilumab or Zoller or the next form, at the, you know, the same time of facilitating OIT prevents this eosinophilic esophagitis. So I think that that is, um, in many clinical trials is definite for us is not. And I think that we need to reconsider, you know, the way we have patients that we say, you know, you will never, and, and as you know, I'm just gonna, this is the last thing I'll say, patients that develop um, EOE associated with oral immunotherapy, 
the least thing that they want to do is to stop the food. And in largely in many a short treatment with medications that are available today, overcome the problem. So the long answer, no. If you have EOE, you might not participate in a clinical trial, but come to Rita, come to us, we'll deal with it. You develop you know, EOE after IT, don't despair, there is a solution. Thank you. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time. So we're gonna pick out a few more questions. There are um, a lot of questions about OIT and EOE in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Katru and Dr. Garcia Lorette, is there any chance of a child outgrowing their allergy during the teen years? And if they do not outgrow it, what are the treatment options at this point? Um, I could jump in there. So yes, the, um, as uh, Dr. Butte mentioned, you know, hormones do play a role and 85% um, of boys as they hit puberty go into remission for A to B in general. A to B meaning allergic rhinitis, asthma, aller um, eczema. And so we do see this, uh, they go into remission and then sometimes it can come back as a young adult or in their thirties or forties, right? So that's in general in a topic world. Now we don't necessarily see that as much in foods, but we do see that there is a percentage of kids that right around puberty will become more tolerant to their food. They may not fully outgrow their food allergy, but they may be able to tolerate a little bit more. So to the point of, can you start OIT in an adolescent? Will they do well? Yeah, a lot of times they do really well um, because A, they're more engaged, they're more on board, they understand the process. Again, they've acknowledge that they want to take on this process. And as Dr. Garcia Lorette mentioned, yes, they will be more aware of symptoms, but they're also more engaged in those symptoms and they have a better understanding. So, um, so OIT at that age is actually very well tolerated, but there is a percentage, you know, again, uh, of boys and girls. Now girls are interesting and Dr. Butte again mentioned this, any hormonal shift a, a female has because of their estrogen progesterones and other hormones, they have a 30% chance of increase in allergy, a 30% chance of decrease in allergy, and a 30% chance everything will stay the same. Same thing for autoimmune issues, any immune dysregulation. So we know that you know during puberty, there is a chance that they may get less atopic, um, maybe less sensitive to the food, maybe even outgrown the food. There are certain people who do uh, become tolerant to the foods. Um, it depends on the foods, of course, you know, whether we're dealing with peanuts or tree nuts or you know, milk or egg, um, but there is a group that does become tolerant. And if they don't, um, that group actually does very well with OIT. To Maria's point, as far as other options for food allergies, um, you know, there are different um, manipulations for OIT that can help people tolerate it better, um, such as, you know, improving their microbiome with starting probiotics or vitamin D or, or you know, helping them tolerate the, the process, as well as biologics, which, which Maria mentioned, which may not only improve their ability to get to, to their, to their maintenance dose faster, but also potentially decrease some of these um, issues that we see with OIT, like eosinophilic esophagitis, where the body is not necessarily sure whether it tolerates the food or not. And it kind of helps immune, right? It, it helps um, induce more tolerance or immune cells that we call like regulatory kind of immune cells so that the body tolerates the, the food better. Thank you. So for our final question, this is um, from one of the people watching. What does the research tell us about how effective treating children with multiple food allergies is with OIT? Can you desensitize someone to multiple foods at the same time? Can you do it sort of one after the other? What should families keep in mind if their kids are allergic to more than one thing? Uh, I, I can do it in. Yes, the answer is yes. You know. 30% of children have multiple food allergies. So, you know, the approach, um, it depends. It, it, multi oral immunotherapy works. It works, some of you might, in the audience might have gone through it. Some of you um, have direct, you know, knowledge of such. Um, you can do it sequentially, um, or you could do it at the same time. Um, we try 
in in the clinical setting, we do this sequentially to minimize the risk. Remember, you know, oral immunotherapy is, is you know, is the opposite of what we were doing ten years ago. You know, so we the data suggests that if you go slow and in stepwise, if let's say non-facilitated oral immunotherapy, it works beautifully. You can, you know, it might take you a year to take care of the peanut and the milk and the egg and the cashew, but we're we're gonna get there. Yeah. Um, uh, on the other hand, when we were talking about using facilitators to make it bigger and, uh, and better and faster, um, the, with the use of medications like omalizumab, you know, a number of clinical studies that is some of which, are, uh, you know, we have done here and we continue to um, perform here at UCLA, so, you know, show that if you give um, the immune system a little bit of a head on, you know, if we try to suppress the allergic reaction with an anti-IgE molecule, we, instead of going one after the other after the other, we can do three at the same time. And we have vast exper experience ourselves and other centers across the, across the country and across, you know, the same in Europe. I think in five years, that would be the standard of care. Dr. Rita and I will be able to prescribe omalizumab as part of the standard oral immunotherapy and start with six foods at a time and be done in six months. Six, six for six. <laughs> That's very exciting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Since we're nearing the end of our hour together, before we wrap up, I'd like to give each of our faculty leaders the opportunity to share any final remarks. Dr. Garcia Lorette, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I, you know, as always, I thank you, Kara and, and Jessica, because your your support and resilience has been, you know, is it continues to be the heart of our program. And for those that that are watching this webinar, um, it is, you know, your your enthusiasm is what, what keeps us going and and what keeps us asking for more instead of um, just, you know, it is what it is, you know, this has been the, the parents and the patients that um, ask for their rights and put us in the, in, the, in the route that we are today. And I'm convinced that, you know, in five, you know, maybe 10 years, we will, you know, food allergy will be a thing of the past. I'm not sure what's going to be the next thing, but definitely food allergy would be a thing of the past. Thank you. Dr. Katru, how about you? Um, so I agree with Maria. We are so thankful to our um, food allergy uh, parent committee, um, especially Jessica and Kira. And, um, and I want to actually just remind everyone that, you know, we are a community and we're all in this together. And we have seen Maria and I had watched food allergy evolve over the years where 15, 20 years ago, nobody was talking about food allergy, even though there were patients who had food allergy. I mean, definitely the numbers have gone up, but the interest wasn't there either. And that has definitely shifted over the years, which is a very exciting um, exciting part of time. You know, I meet uh, older allergists who've never even don't even know how to treat food allergy. And now we're having this whole evolution where um, there's so much interest in not only how to manage food, diagnosing food allergy, how to prevent food allergy, how to manage food allergy, but as Maria said, how can we potentially cure food allergy? How can we make this a thing of the past? And, um, and so this is a very exciting time for food allergy. And so I'm really um, hopeful as Maria is that we can continue with doing our research, which we're doing here at UCLA, that we can translate that research into clinical OIT and other interventions, which we're doing here as well. Um, and I encourage all of you to feel comfortable with your adolescents and young adults. Enjoy this time. It's a super exciting time. It's a super difficult time. Um, and, but you're not alone. And it's really, it's fun. And feel proud of the young adults that want to be independent that you created um, that space for and just keep encouraging them to take that responsibility to really engage with their care. Because I think instead of fighting them on it, it's more having them buy in um, to, to what, what's happening around them. Thank you. Dr. Butte, let's end with you. 
Yeah, thank you. And and thanks everyone for joining in. This is always fun for us to, to answer questions that come directly from you guys. Uh, we're doing our best to, to try to help all of you. And um, and certainly we weren't able to get to all the questions. I know many people are asking very specific questions and we can't give medical advice, but take those questions to your allergist and and, and get the answers you need because the, you know we, we can answer many of those questions one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I, I have to echo uh, what both Rita and Maria just said, which is that we do have a goal here of curing food allergy. Uh, I, I do um, believe that the way we're gonna get to that cure is through the science to understand why people don't become tolerant to certain foods and, and why some people do. Uh, understanding the mechanisms of how the immune system regulates that process uh, uh, is going to be the key to curing it. And we have all kinds of immunology knowledge now that has been blossoming since um, we're, we're throwing immunology at cancer with great success. And there's lots of new knowledge there about tolerance um, there, and, and certainly with autoimmunity and infections uh, as well. Uh, that knowledge about immunology has to be moved over to foodology now over the next few years. And, and then if we can do that, if we can uh, grow this program and programs nationwide, get more funding from the NIH for this issue, uh, we definitely can cure this disease. It is, it is not at all unreasonable for what Maria said um, to be able to say that food allergy is a thing of the past five or 10 years from now. Uh, we have some of the plans now at UCLA to how to build our program in this area. And you know, we'd love to hear from you guys if you have uh, thoughts and ideas about how we can, how you can help us get there. Certainly the Food Allergy Committee, the Parent Committee has been uh, incredibly helpful for this too. Uh, so anyway, join us. We're, we're super excited to join with you. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. I love seeing you even on these little screens. Uh, thank you to everybody in the food allergy community who joined us today. Thank you for your questions that you pre-submitted. There were so many questions in the chat. Um, I feel like uh, there's so much ground to cover and we'd love to do more webinars on subjects that you're interested in. Um, I'll just end by saying, as parents of teens and young adults, you have been navigating food allergies for a very long time, and you have done a heroic job keeping your kids safe. Um, I'm grateful for this entire food allergy community and, um, and all the work that's being done at UCLA, and it inspires me to stay confident that a cure is in uh, reach. If you're interested in learning more about UCLA's food allergy program, uh, the chat box will have some links for you. Everyone who registered for today's webinar will receive an email with a video link from today's event, along with a survey, which we encourage you to please fill out. And on behalf of the UCLA Food Allergy Parent Committee, thank you so much for joining us. Take good care, and we hope to see you again soon.